Have you ever wondered what would happen if all of a sudden all the banks were to close? And no, I don't mean what would happen to the economy in general terms. I mean, what would happen to you personally with your own savings? Think about it. If you've had your money in the bank, but the bank ceases to exist, where does your savings go? Could you claim them from someone? Maybe from the shareholders, maybe from the government, or maybe you would lose your money forever. The truth is that until now, the closest we have come to something like this happening was during the 2008 financial crisis. And yes, I did say close because the governments of the major countries were able to bail out the banks with public money before the banks failed. But are we really going to be able to keep saving the banks forever? Unlike in 2008, governments these days owe far more money than they are able to collect. For example, in Europe alone, public debt has increased by a factor of two since 2008. So what does that mean? Well, in the face of a new crisis scenario, governments will find it much more difficult to come to the rescue of banks. They may even have to let financial institutions go under. This scenario raises a few questions. What would happen on the day when there is no choice but to let the banks fail? Is it true that the banks are too big to fail? Would our economies collapse? Guess what? The answer is much more surprising than you might imagine. In fact, we lied to you a little bit at the beginning of this video, because while most countries did save their banks into the 2008 crisis, there was one country that let them collapse completely. Which country are we talking about? What exactly happened? What happened to the savings of its clients? Well, to find out, let's start with a little bit of history. The Cyprus Disaster. This is what we promised you, Visual Economic Community. We were going to tell you the story of the country that let its banks fail. And yes, that country, as many of you already know, was Cyprus. To understand the whole story, the first thing to understand is that, contrary to common belief, a bank's job is not to take your money and keep it. Rather, what a bank does is take your money and lend it to others. These loans can take the form of a mortgage, a corporate loan, and they can also be used to buy billions of euros in sovereign debt from a country such as Greece, which is exactly what happened in this case. That is, the separate bank decided to lend money to the Greek state. The problem is that Greece was the country most affected by the Eurozone crisis. To give you an idea, since the financial crisis, Greece went from being a country with a wealth comparable to that of Spain to being poorer than Eastern European countries such as Lithuania or Slovakia. And do you want to know what all this meant? Well, take a look. Biggest debt restructuring in history buys Greece only a bit of time. That's right. Greece owed a lot of money to everybody, including the Cyprus banks. And since we couldn't pay it back, they said they were suspending the payment of the debt. And many of you will be thinking, well, that's good, isn't it? Something like a victimless crime. Instead of paying back the money, Greece could continue to spend it on schools and hospitals. And anyway, who cares? Well, I'll tell you who cared a lot, the Cypriot banks. And what happens when a Cypriot bank lends a lot of money to the Greek government, and one day the Greek government says it will not pay it back? Three, two, one, exactly. What happens is the bank fails. The next day and the separate money? Well, what happens to it? Well, let's see. The truth is that the most frequent solution is for governments to bail out banks so they don't go bankrupt. That is to say, they pump in a lot of public money. And you may ask, so why didn't the Cyprus just bail out its banks? As we've already mentioned, rescuing a bank consists of giving it enough money to survive, but Cyprus had a gigantic problem, and that is that in order to plug the hole in its banking system, it needed to spend no less than 60% of its GDP. To give you an idea, 60% of GDP would be something like adding up all the taxes collected for almost two full years. If Cyprus wanted to bail out its banks, it would lose the equivalent of two years worth of healthcare, education, pension, roads. It was something it simply could not afford. And I know what you were thinking. Cyprus is in the European Union. Why don't they just ask their EU colleagues for help? And here is the most curious aspect of the Cyprus economy. And it is right here that Mother Russia enters the scene. During the pre-crisis years, Cyprus has been the perfect country for Russian fortunes. That's right. Cyprus was the cradle of money laundering for the wealthy Russians and also Ukrainians who could bring all the money earned in, let's say, somewhat irregular ways. Well, the fact is that the Russian boom in the country was of such magnitude that one out of every three euros deposited in Cypriot banks belonged to Russian investors and savers. And so, naturally, do you think that saving Russians with the taxes of European citizens seemed like a good idea to the Germans and the Dutch? Well, I'm telling you, the answer was no. Conclusion. Were the banks destined to fail? What would happen to the the economy of Cyprus if everyone lost their money. Well, relax, friends, because all was not lost. Contrary to what we've always been told until now, the truth is that yes, banks can fail without causing an economic cataclysm. What's more, they may go bankrupt and their bankruptcy may be a better solution than any public bailout. The question is, how could such a thing be achieved? Well, check this out. Rescue from the inside. Faced with the desperate situation in Cyprus, the European Union proposed a new plan that could allow the banks to stay afloat despite having failed and without any public bailout. This type of bankruptcy is known as a bail-in. How is it possible for a bank to go bankrupt but stay afloat after it has failed? To understand this, let's imagine that we set up our own bank. And of course, if one day you want to start a company, you will need to be clear about how this works. A balance sheet. 
As I mentioned earlier, our objective now is to set up our imaginary bank, and to do so, we'll need to make an initial investment. Let's imagine we put in $100,000. What appears on the left column is what is known as the asset. Assets is the section where the properties of the company are recorded. And what properties does our bank have? Exactly, it has the $100,000 that we have invested. Therefore, we include that in the assets. Now, if the assets belong to the company, what should we write down in the right column? The right column is where two things go, liabilities and equity. That is, both liabilities and equity are the origin of our properties. It is the source of origin and the money put in by the shareholders. It is recorded as equity. And if the origin is loans, it is recorded as liabilities. In any case, the $100,000 has been invested by us, who are the shareholders. So we include it in the net equity. Please note one very important thing, the golden rule of accounting. Since the right column explains where the properties we indicate on the left come from, the two columns must always add up to the same amount. So for example, if we have $100,000 in assets, $100,000 should also appear in the right column. This is called balancing a balance sheet. Well, now we have our bank. One year after opening the bank, we had many clients bring us their savings. Specifically, we now have $1 million saved that we update in our assets. But watch out. Unlike before, this new money has not been provided by us. It has been lent to us by our customers. And what does this mean? Well, we have to note its origin in the liabilities. Remember that the liabilities are the bank's debts. Perfect. Now that we have a decent amount of money, it is time to start lending it. And as we do not want to put all of our chickens in the same basket, we will use $800,000 to give mortgages, but the other two $200,000 we will use to buy Greek debt. If you notice, right now our bank has $1 million in assets, but only owes $900,000. This is what should normally happen with the balance sheet of a financially healthy bank. So then what happens when the Greeks say that they're not going to pay their debt? Well, basically the $200,000 that we had in Greek debt in our assets are suddenly erased. And that is exactly where the problem lies. After the Greek default, there was only $800,000 left in our assets column, but we still owe $900,000. And remember the golden rule of accounting? The balance sheet must always balance. If you notice, Right now, the rule is not being followed. So we have to modify the right column so that it adds up to the same money as our assets. Now, what do we modify? In reality, we cannot touch the liabilities. That is to say, the liabilities are our debts and those debts are going to continue to be there no matter what we do. So we only have one alternative left to reduce the net worth. But now, I know what many of you are thinking. If our net worth is $100,000, but we have a gap of $200,000, if we subtract it all, we are left with a net worth of negative $100,000. And what does this mean? Well, exactly. It is what is known as a a technical bankruptcy. And now it is at this point that the bail-in comes into play. In a normal bankruptcy, the bank would close and its assets would be distributed amongst its creditors, in this case, the depositors of the money, that is, the customers, leaving the whole of $100,000 unpaid. In other words, if the bank were to close, our clients would lose a large part of their savings they entrusted to us. But the bail-in proposes an alternative. Instead of closing the bank with unpaid debts, a part of the liabilities can be converted into equity of the company. In this way, the net worth will become positive again and the bank will emerge from technical bankruptcy. This means that customers lose part of their savings, but in in exchange, they become the new owners of the bank. In other words, they receive shares in the bank. In a sense, it is as if the customers have bought the bank from its former owners, but instead of buying it by paying money, they buy it by forgiving part of the debts. And so, if you needed to move $200,000 from liabilities to equity to save yourself from bankruptcy, and $20,000 was taken from you to do that, you would now own 10% of the bank. And of course, if all goes well, and the company, in this case, the bank, survives, the new owners will be able to sell shares and get their money back, or even earn more by collecting dividends. Well, this is bail-in theory and it works very well. The question, the real question is, what happened in practice? What happened in Cyprus? Did the bail-in really work? Well, let's find out. From the book to the street. I don't know if you know this, but the European Central Bank protects deposits of up to 100,000 euros against any bankruptcy, even against a bail-in. That is, if you are a European and you have less than 100,000 euros in the bank, you are in luck. The European Central Bank will protect you with its banknote machine. That is why in Cyprus, the bail-in, which applied exclusively to deposits of more than 100,000 euros in total, only 4% of the customers of the major banks were affected by this. And yes, we are talking mostly about the rich Russians. Specifically, people who had more than 100,000 euros in Cyprus banks lost on average 50% of their savings. But they did receive shares in their banks in exchange for that money. And so you may ask, how did it end up working out then? Were they able to recover the money over time? Well, the truth is that some did and others did not. You see, in Cyprus, there was two main banks, Lakai Bank and the Bank 
of Cyprus. In both banks, a bail-in was done. And while the Bank of Cyprus, which was the larger of the two, did well and ended up recovering over time, Lekai ended up going bankrupt and closing for good, even after applying the bail-in. So what happened to their customers? Well, they ended up completely losing 94 out of every 100 euros they invested to bail in. Or to put it another way, about half of the money they had deposited in the bank. But then, if those clients lost so much money, is the bail-in really a good idea? As in everything, the bail-in has its advantages and disadvantages, and above all, some winners and some losers. The good thing about the bail-in is that there is no need to use public money to save private banks. The ones who lose the money are, usually, the big fortunes and the shareholders, and not the regular citizens with their taxes. For example, when Spain bailed out the savings banks in 2012, no customer of any bank lost a single euro. But on the other hand, it's estimated that around 43 billion euros from the state coffers were lost. Or to illustrate it another way, it's as if every Spaniard had lost a month's salary to deal with the bailout. And all this is assuming that the state has money for a bailout, which we have seen in Cyprus is not always the case. In that sense, bailing in is always a better solution than bankruptcy, in which case it's guaranteed that you will lose your money. Of course, if you remember in the previous video about the 2008 crisis, you may be wondering, okay, Spain lost money with its bailout, but Bush was able to bail out the American banks, which ended up recovering and no one lost a dollar. Isn't that the best option? If we look at it in the short term, yes, there could be a bailout that could be recovered over time, as Bush did. But then what incentive would the banks have to do the thing properly if they know they're going to be bailed out every time they have a problem? And what's more, when banks take too many risks because they know they are going to be bailed out, they are able to create crises like the one in 2008. This is exactly what is known as a moral hazard. And the best way to stop them from behaving like that is to hold them accountable for their bad behavior. And that is the question we leave you with. Is it moral? right to use public money to bail out a private bank. What do you think about the bail-in? Do you think it is the ultimate measure for controlling banks? What would you have done with Cyprus and the Russians if you had been the European Union? Do you still believe that there are banks that are too big to fail? You can leave me your answers in the comments below. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and then a little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it so we know. All the best and I'll see you next time.